ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. My name is Jared Moon, and with me today is Kyle Schramm from the great state of Tennessee and Joe Courtney, who's in a place that will remain nameless. And then gentlemen, we would oversee. How's your how's your life? Fantastic. I think pretty good. My hair's great. getting long. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going straight to the shout outs. Let's do that. Uh, so we have Jonathan hmm, Simarge. Simarge? Sim, sorry, Jonathan, for butchering your last name. I should have. Should we just start over? We should just start the whole podcast over. Never, anyway, maybe. Jonathan knows. Yeah, we, we, we almost never do that. Everything just gets recorded. Um, and he said that he is doing a Go Ruck team assessment May 6th through 8th, which I'm not even 100% sure what that is. But it sounds like it's probably hard because a lot of brutal. The, a lot of the GoRuck stuff is hard. So Jonathan, good luck, and also sorry again for if I got the last name wrong. Uh, there's no way for me to know if I'm right. Um, but uh, again, apologies. But good luck on your GoRuck team assessment, May six through eight. Three days worth of GoRuck. That sounds sounds hard, right? Sounds brutal to me. I know GoRuck has their selection. Have you guys seen that? Mm-hmm. They even have a documentary about it on on hulu it's called the standard i did um, not know that yeah so i'll just plug and go ruck stuff there it's um it's literally the dumbest endurance event ever created and i actually have more respect for the go ruck guys having watched the documentary because i've known about their selection for a long time and i was like look i get it that you guys are all special operations but what you're putting people through is nowhere close to what actual army army selection is it's not how, how buds mm-hmm. operates. Um, and then once they kind of admitted that in the documentary, I was like, Oh, okay. Like you're, you're good. Like you guys know that you created the most ridiculous thing on the planet. And, uh, the biggest thing, like they don't, they're it's two days and they don't let them eat. Um, I think they might give them some like Pedialyte halfway through, but in, Jeez. in buds, they feed them like every three hours because they know that it's not possible for a human being to continue like without calories right so anyway tangent right off the bat go check out the documentary if you're interested in that stuff uh that's an event i will never be doing um also not really interested in go ruck events anyway because of the whole military dynamic that it has but i guess we could reserve that for a different podcast uh updates joe how's life pretty good (laughs) finally trying to get back into the swing of things as we were talking about before the podcast it just takes a while to get get back into things and get in my groove and finally doing a couple workouts uh again uh oh yeah yeah yeah. thanks for reminding me (laughs) no i'm just kidding yeah go ahead this is finally going back to work tomorrow uh i'm trying to get back into like a working routine as normal being in my office doing things but it just it just takes a minute especially like being unplugged completely for seven plus days, eight or nine days, you know? Mm. So yeah, working on that. And last and a uh, part of getting back into the swing of things, whether it's eating clean and uh, you know, nutrition, fitness and stuff like that, I decided to do a bone broth cleanse. Once I got back, I did a little bit of research on this leading up to it. And because I make my own bone broth, I always have some in the freezer. And one of the first things I did when we got back was make a whole nother batch, a whole giant batch. So uh, first I want to say that that I've never, I'm not one for cleanses. I don't normally do them. I don't really, I don't want to say I don't believe in them, but I think people use cleanses too much as like, Hey, I'm just going to clean myself out and hopefully, uh, but cleanse for like a week, 10 days, 21 days and lose a whole bunch of weight right now so that I look good for this weekend. And then I'm just going to go back to 
eating like shit. Uh, so that's not what cleanses are, I think, meant for. And what I didn't use it for, I just did a 24 hour bone broth cleanse. And the entire purpose of it was to clean out, reset my gut and get rid of all the bloat from traveling and all that. And it worked out great. Uh, literally all I just drank was my own homemade, uh, bone broth that I know is legit for 24 hours. I just, whenever I was feeling hungry, I just drank uh, like a bowl of bone broth and it went great. Um, basically, basically. fast, right? Just with yep. a better source of liquid than water. Basically. Yeah. Uh, is what I did and got rid of all the post traveling bloat and cleaned me out and yeah, good to go. Well, hop back into it. I had to, you know, s- slowly eat a little bit the next day, but it was fine. And I think it worked out great. So if you, uh, I guess, do a big travel and maybe have something like that that you need to clear up, I <clears throat> say it'd be a decent option if you make, especially if you make your own bone broth. But like I said, I make my own, so I know it's legit. <clears throat> I'm only going to, I'd only do this like once every couple of months. I'm not going to like, oh man, I really want to look good this weekend. I'm going to do another cleanse. So don't do, don't do that. Don't be dumb. Uh, yeah. And so I want to jump in real quick. Uh, Kyle just nudged me and I want to make sure I'm clear on something with GoRuck stuff. Um, I want to be very clear. I think GoRuck is cool. I own GoRuck stuff. I personally have no interest in their events because of my military background. I don't think I could go get yelled at. And this is not true of every person who served in the military. It's This is Jared Moon's experience in the military. I could not go get yelled at by some former special operations guy and just even take it seriously. And, and that's just me. I would probably end up so frustrated and mad that I would end up quitting the event. So that's probably what they'd want. Right. Um, and again, this is me. I think, uh, for the team events that they put on are great. I have people who with military backgrounds who love them. I do. I stand by my thing that selection is the dumbest endurance event I've ever seen put together, but that's what they say in the documentary too. They're like, we know this is the dumbest thing that you could possibly do as a human being. And that's what I mean by dumb. I mean, like running an ultra marathon or biking 10,000 miles or whatever. Those are like set parameter things here. They just basically go until they make sure they only have one person left and they make you do ridiculous things for 48 hours. And uh, it's probably the hardest thing that you could, possibly do as well so i'm not as i do with crossfit throwing shade like i have actually big problems with crossfit go ruck's cool not for me but go ruck's cool overall the company is cool so let's be very clear about what i meant with my opinions on go ruck sweet kyle how's your life life is grand um lots of house projects going on right now Um, does not sound grand yeah. That doesn't sound grand at all. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, just the prospect of new things in the future, in the near future. Anyway, I'm covering them up with my body right now, but you, you can't see it. But like everything in our house that was hung on a wall is like in this corner behind me in my gym. So it's not all cluttered up for you guys, but it's cluttered up for me, kind of driving me crazy. But we had to take everything off the walls because I've got to paint basically all the walls in our house and so lots of painting going on all that kind of stuff some other stuff but uh just trying to get the house ready to put on the market go get a new place and get a little bit extra space and all that kind of stuff also potentially not so within the next year probably jumping into a little bit of real estate investing maybe so that's that's what I'm really excited about. But this is kind of like all this kind of stuff is like the steps leading to that. So that's what I'm really excited about. But I'm looking ahead to that and kind of ignoring the fact that I have to paint part of my house every night. So because I can't paint when the kids are here. That's just no, nope, not going to happen. Not going to work. Thanks so I have to work. spend. Yeah, I have to spend like two or three hours at night after they go to bed um, painting things. So. That's rough. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, you're at least crushing an audio book during that time frame. Absolutely. Right. I crushed an entire book last night. There it was go. a really short one, but it was an entire book, so it counts. But yeah, crushing so, all kinds of all kinds of audio content during that time. 
So I think one of our athletes, or I didn't, I know one of our athletes, I think her name's Sarah. I can't remember, but she just moved to Tennessee mm-hmm. and yep. she combined both garage gym and basement gym. Her base, her garage is in the basement. So I think she has set the bar for you to find a house with a basement garage gym. Those are hmm. cool. I, you guys saw my, so by the Your time you guys basement. got there, I had a garage gym, but yeah, that walkout basement I had in Asheville was super legit. Yeah. That yeah. Awesome. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that would be cool. I mean, I guess technically, if I took the door off, uh, leading out to my garage <laughs> from my basement, which is right there, uh, I would probably technically have a garage gym basement. Uh, yeah, but yeah, you don't right now. So, but I don't I mean, right now. The door is there, so no, I don't have. Don't it. steal that from her. No, I'm not <laughs> taking it away. Uh, so, or is that everything? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. We can move. I, I just I have a quick update. Um, I keep updating everybody on the on the uh, build out office build out. Well, they had to run a plumbing line from my house to that structure um, to get water there, and it had to run through my garage. My garage is a detached, uninsulated garage, so it is very bad practice to have a plumbing line run through such a space because of things like snowmageddon that happen. And uh, while the chances are very rare, your pipes could very easily freeze in a space like that um, without setup. So anyway, I'm essentially doing a garage gym remodel um, almost by, I'm forced to. Uh, So it's getting insulated, spray foam insulation throughout the entire garage, which means I have to take every single thing out, everything out of the garage. And then I have to, they have to spray it. and then after they spray it, I'll move everything back in, but I'm also going to, I'm not going to put drywall up. I'm going to put like some other stuff up on, on the walls. So the space will look pretty cool. And I'll probably shoot some videos on, on the process of doing that. Um, I'm also removing a bunch of stuff out of there. I don't know if you guys remember, there was like an old like fan from a house that was like they had installed in there and all this cabinetry and all this other stuff. So we already got rid of all that. That was basically my weekend was, uh, demoing all that crap and getting it out of there and and cleaning up a bunch of stuff um so anyway kind of in the middle is garage gym remodels really churching it up it's really like Mm. getting getting some insulation and that's about it but uh i'm also looking forward to that because 120 degrees in a detached garage isn't fun so now maybe it'll only be 90 degrees with the insulation so yeah that is pretty awesome i mean if we're gonna work out there when we're in the office i don't want to work out in that those temperatures yeah mostly the cold too i don't work out in the cold i neither one has bothered me that much but uh when it gets awful emily will just stop using the space she'll be like nah i'm gonna do something else like (laughs) and now she'll continue to use it year round so it's also a benefit for the family which is good there you go that's it let's get into this study um talking about cluster sets today the name of the study is chronic effects of altering resistance training set configurations using cluster sets a systematic review and meta-analysis 2021 Uh, first i think that we should start with what a cluster set is Uh, so a cluster set is really just breaking a normal set into micro sets and um, we can talk about the benefits of that uh, but that's that's all you're really doing so if you had a uh, a set of 10 repetitions at uh, a high percentage, say 70%. That's typically what you want to do with cluster sets too. It's not made for just resting. You have a, a miniature rest in there. So let's say it's nine reps, make it easier. You do three sets of three, but there'd only be about eight to 15 seconds of rest in between those three sets of three. So you do three reps, rest, rack it, rest eight seconds, um, do do three rest eight seconds do three and then that would be your one set of nine as opposed to just doing one set of nine outright and like why even do that at all is it worth it does it make any sense at all i guess is kind of the Mm -hmm. question we hope to answer by the end of this podcast or by the end of this uh study talking about it because this is not just some random uh one study this is 29 studies of the total of 803 subjects that met the inclusion criteria for the systematic review. Um, and we can get into the, the breakdown of all that. But the, the main purpose of the study uh, was to summarize and analyze the research comparing the effects of tra- traditional sets, like I was talking about, three times nine versus three times three sets of three with these tiny rests, in various cluster set configurations on hypertrophy 
and gains in strength, power output, movement velocity, and strength endurance. And I'm so glad that they looked at all these things and not just one individual thing, because if they just looked at hypertrophy, we might end up with a different answer. If they just looked at strength, we might end up with a different answer. If we just looked at velocity, we might end up with a different answer. But they looked at all the totality of the evidence to decide whether or not a a cluster set was beneficial. Um, And ultimately, it was. uh, Cluster sets were more beneficial, uh, but it had to do with being more beneficial in power output and velocity was the the main takeaway. And we could talk about that a lot more, but I'd love to hear what you guys uh, thought about this systematic review on cluster sets. Yeah, I think it was a really cool to see that they were, uh, they're, they're mainly looking to see if that uh, cluster sets would be any different than just doing your traditional sets because you know you have your volume, you have your sets. So why would this be any different? Well, the difference is uh, not so much strength and endurance. It is the velocity, which is super great because we like to train velocity and uh, power because we want to start lifting faster, which uh, Jerry wrote an article about years ago that that is the missing element in a lot of people's strength programs anyway. It's called so, the missing element in your strength program. If you want to yeah. Google it, that's the article. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah, there you go. Uh, so if you're already, if you, there's no, not really any takeaway, but you're still benefiting from power and velocity, then why not do it? And we use it a fair amount. I usually use it a good amount in strength because when programming strength, I want to get enough volume and strength out of the athletes, but it's also, I also want to get in power as well. So mixing the two is fantastic tool to do. And we also use different types of, um, uh, cluster sets as well. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. there's some that we'll do for up to 12 reps and there's, uh, for a lower load and, uh, or or a lighter load, lower rest times. And then there's one that we'll do, uh, um, heavier load, less reps, but more rest time. So you can still kind of govern it that way to, to fit whatever training you're doing, whether you're lifting heavy or lifting lighter, um, for, you know, volume reps, rest, all that stuff. So I think it, it is a great tool to vary your strength than just, you know, the typical go to your five by five and go to your five by three, because, uh, you can, you can keep the volume up or even increase your volume and improving your, uh, power and velocity as well. Um, but uh, we'll turn it over to Kyle, see what he has, because there's not a whole lot else to say besides cluster sets are, are good. But uh, yeah, Kyle, what you got? It's a good way to get the same amount of work with less fatigue to manage fatigue better. And I think that's what helps you with your velocity over, over the course of the, of the workout is not being as fatigued and being able to keep the same velocity for all the reps and make the reps more effective. Um, and you can also... Uh, when you're less fatigued, you have less concern of form breaking down, technique breaking down. So obviously, any time that we talk about resistance training, we talk about technique, and you need to keep technique um, perfect, as close to perfect as you can. And when technique starts to drop off, that's when you need to um, re-rack the weight, maybe potentially rest a little longer, maybe potentially lower the load. But with cluster sets, instead of having, for instance, having a set of nine, one set of nine really one set of nine is good you're gonna get fatigued at that point you know i mean the the old the old joke is you know anything over five reps is cardio right but it's like when you're doing resistance training any any set of nine like you're gonna get tired if you have to do nine at a time and so if you break that up into three mini sets so it's three mini sets of three and you've got you know 10 15 seconds of rest in between those mini sets you can keep like you can bang out three rest for a few seconds, bang out three more, and you can keep the velocity on all those reps and get, get better work, more efficient and more effective work out of it. And so that's kind of the, the mindset behind cluster sets. And I remember the first time that Jared threw cluster sets into our programming here at Garage and Athlete. And I looked at that and I was like, what, what is this guy doing? Like, what, what is the purpose behind this? And then I did it. I did the workout that day and I was like, man, this is awesome. This is so crazy. Um, but anyway, super effective. It's also a really good way to uh, shake things up in your programming instead of kind of what Joe said, of, okay, just go do your five by five. You know what I mean? That gets really boring. You know what I mean? And so you can, there's a lot of different ways to do cluster sets and all the, the studies that they examined for this meta analysis, they, they kind of ran the gamut on the different kinds of cluster sets that they used in their study. 
And so there's just a lot of different ways to do it um, and shake things up in your program to keep things interesting where it's not just doing traditional sets and just doing the same old thing over and over the linear progression. Like you can actually see, you can program a linear progression, but you can actually make it work differently and feel differently, feel better over time because you're getting the same amount of work in, but you change it up with cluster sets and actually get people a different stimulus and make people kind of stick with it a little bit longer too. So um, anyway, those are the things I took out of it. I like to see that, you know, it kind of proven that cluster sets are effective and that they do work and um, because they do. So I'm glad to see a study that says that and then just use them to shake up your programming a little bit and, um, and be more effective with it. Yeah. And I think what you said about fatigue is hundred percent correct. And I really, this, a lot of this goes back to, I wish uh, all studies included like a strength and conditioning coach, because sometimes they just look at total volume when it comes to like science and strength training, that that's what they're looking at. They're like total volume. Like how could, why would it matter if the volume's the same or, and you add volume each week, like that's how you should get stronger. That's, you know, just sets times reps times weight. Uh, but there's like an, an execution part that's lost mm. on, within science. And that is how was the weight lifted and how the weight was lifted when we get down to velocity and power is very important. And as Joe said, it can be even further broken down. Like if you were to actually go through our coach accelerator program, shameless plug, uh, you could learn a lot of this stuff, but we have, we have, um, cluster sets broken down by how much you should rest. If your goal is hypertrophy, how much you should rest and what the sets should be. And then same for, if you're looking for more power-based stuff and same, if you're looking for more strength-based stuff. And so cluster sets can, can be very beneficial. And it goes back to that, that how the weight is lifted, because if you move weight quicker, you're going to be more powerful. If you're more, if you're more powerful, you will be stronger. It's just how things work. Um, and I really do think that anyone should go, uh, check out my article on that stuff. Uh, cause I went, to, I did a deep dive on it. It's a three part series. It's uh, the missing element in your strength program. The other one's like how to lift with, uh, more speed, more horsepower. And then the last one, the reason Joe is even working here right now, why CrossFit will make you weaker. Um, and so the, it's a three part series. All three articles are linked. So if you guys want to check it out, you definitely can. Uh, but the premise that we teach in the course um in the coach accelerated program is what we call test top end simulation training and i think that's the biggest takeaway i want to give for athletes is the more you can see this top end of your performance potential and what i mean by c is like experience it with your body um so if that's a an interval um on the rower or running to where you're getting into that maximum heart rate maybe for 10 seconds and this is the same with cluster sets. If you can get into and see this 90%, 95%, 98% of your one rep max, the more often your body can see and experience those things, that's where you're actually making the progress. The smaller amounts of volume and lifting accessory work, those things are very beneficial, but they're not necessarily what's actually moving the performance needle forward. And so you have to find a way to simulate these top end environments. And I think interval training by itself is a phenomenal way to do this. If we're talking about aerobic conditioning or energy system training, then we talk about strength training, like, well, how else can I do it? You know, there's 10 sets of one, 10 sets of two. Um, you could do that, or you could do cluster sets, which is a much more efficient way to get that done and to see these top ends. And I think that's a lot of how it should be used. If you're looking to gain strength is like, let's do, Cause if I were to program 90% for you, Kyle today, like I'd probably do, you know, let's just say three sets of three at 90 and that would, that would kind of be it, you know? But mm -hmm. if I was like, Hey, I want, I'd rather see uh, three sets of six at 90, but the six are broken into three sets of two mm -hmm. um, cluster sets with 15 sets. You're going to see now you see 90 a lot more than you did previously. Right. Yep. And, and it's still going to actually be doable as opposed to just saying do nineties until you fail you know, you're actually going to be able to perform the training. So, uh, the, the takeaway I have for the athlete is that top end simulation training principle. The test principle is if you want to move the performance needle, you need to see that top end, whether, whether that's, uh, you know, it's, it's intensity, but you don't need to see it like 
for a 15 minute Metcon. It's just something that you need to visit and experience to move the performance needle forward. Um, but that's not everyone's goal. And so it's not something you have to do to make progress. But if you're like, this is where I get frustrated with athletes who have been training for a long time. And then they get frustrated with their lack of progress or PRs after let's say four or five years, you've moved out of the honeymoon phase. And so if you, if you're no longer pushing yourself, that that's fine. If you want to be in maintenance mode, that's fine. Like I'm not trying to PR anything right now. My back is injured. Like I'm not trying to do, I'm just like, Hey, let's try and maintain as much as I can. So that's where my mindset is when I'm training every single day. But that mindset is different when I'm like, Hey, I want to get to a 500 pound back squat. I can't just mindlessly go through the programming and be like, yeah, you know, maybe my, maybe my back squat will end up at 500. If I just do some sets and reps every day, it's not how it works. I'm going to have to experience some pain. I'm going to have to see some things that are very uncomfortable and, uh, you know, go through those things to make that performance progress. And that's where people get lost because in the beginning, it's not that painful to see progress. It's just doing the work. But then if you want to continue to see results, you need to quit complaining and put in more work and experience more pain. And that's where you will see more performance gains. So that's the, uh, the takeaway for me. Yeah. That's actually one thing I wanted to kind of highlight or almost caveat with cluster sets. Uh, if you're a beginner or still like working on your form technique and, and building up your weights, I don't think you need to be doing cluster sets or should be doing cluster sets because they can be a little bit more intense. And we might have you doing a nine reps at 70% breaking down to three, 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 but you're racking the weight and you only have 20 seconds. Your heart rate's still up. You still need to pick that bar up and lift it with good form while your heart rate's up. So you need to be comfortable and used to lifting weight at a, a decent intensity, uh, over and over again, and to have that experience. So if you're newer, it might not be that great because you, your form could suffer. You could be you know, too out of breath to, uh, it might be too intense for you, but if you're, you know, intermediate to experience, I think cluster sets are fantastic to put in. It's just like a meet yourself Saturday. You got to go there. And, uh, I do agree with you, Joe. It's like, it's not a magic. It's not a magic thing. Like if you just, you heard about cluster sets for the first time today and you're like, Ooh, I've been, yeah, I've been strength training for three months. Let me go hit the magic button here <laughs> over with cluster sets. It, it probably won't be very beneficial for you. And if you get into the actual study, they break down like how many were untrained subjects and how many were trained yep. and all these other things. And if we broke it down even further, uh, which they did not, um, I don't think, or I didn't see at least, I would love to know the performance gains in each one of those metrics, power output, strength, hypertrophy, movement velocity, strength, endurance per group. Um, Cause my, my guess would be cluster sets are not beneficial next to at all for an untrained subject are not more beneficial than traditional strength training. Is what I mean. Not, not beneficial. Cause if you do it, you're it's, it's just lifting at that point. Like it's, you're going to get stronger, but yeah, it's not going to be like, that could be the game changer for Joe to get stronger is yeah. the implementation of cluster sets. Cause um, they're not lifting at they're not, they're not worried about their volume or, or, or power up, but they're just like trying to lift the weight and actually get through the sets versus what the clusters better aimed for. Yeah. Awesome. And you guys have anything else on cluster sets? Nope. I like them. They will be in strength programming pretty mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah. We use cluster sets a lot. We use tempo lifting a lot. We don't just stick to the boring stuff all the time. Really rarely do we do that. Uh, so if you're listening to this, my, uh, middle of the podcast plug for garage gym athlete, go sign up for garage gym athlete at garage gym and experience real programming and not the fake random stuff that makes you sweat and makes you feel like you're doing something. Perfect. All well, right. Go we can <laughs> end it right here. <laughs> yeah. Just, dang. It's a little early, but yep. good. Um, all right. So let's get onto the topic. We're talking about the Murph burner track. We'll be talking about this over and over because we're doing a huge fundraiser for the month of May for the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Um, and I'm going to kind of field questions from Joe and Kyle. Um, and I also gave them very little notice about this. So I might also just uh, throw in my own things I want you to know. Uh, but the Murph Burner track, I won't explain anything. I'll just see what questions I get and then I'll explain what I feel wasn't explained. You guys, fire away. We're going to be talking about the Murph Burner track today. How many times are we actually doing the full Murph workout in the four weeks? 
Oh, you're getting into the exact programming? Oh, Great. okay. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I so no. Diving will... right in. Well, I can answer Somebody that. actually there... asked that. Somebody actually asked that. You will not be doing um, Murph like multiple times per week leading up to doing Murph. That, to me, to me, that would be bad programming, to be honest. Um, See? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, that's a that's good a question. Softball. That's softball. Yeah. <laughs> The Murph burner track is just 30 days of Murph. <laughs> yeah. You'll be a, you'll be a master by the time you get to the Memorial day workout. That, that that's the uh, Chris Morgan track. That's yeah. Not... yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we should name it. What's the overall, what's the overall goal? What's the overall purpose of the Murph burner track? So the overall goal purpose of the Murph burner track, are we talking about from a programming standpoint? Sure. Okay. I just mean why I just mean why are we doing it? The why big we... reason we're doing it is yeah. one, Murph is a big part of this community. Yeah. Um, with how things have just progressed over the years. With me doing Murph every week for a year twice, and then other people taking that even further, and now how many people in the community we have taking on that same challenge amongst others. Um, so I just feel like we are uh, as far as this community goes, the most experienced Murph crew on the planet you know, collectively as a community. Uh, so I think that this is where Murph information should be sourced. Um, but the, the big reason is, uh, it's a fundraiser for the special operations warrior foundation. Um, because we, I mean, we don't need to do a Murph burner track, right? Like we could just, we have tracks. That's fine. Like we don't need to do any other tracks, but this, we are donating all of the money to the special operations warrior foundation. And that's the big reason why now from a, an individual standpoint, why would you want to do it other than donating to a good cause and getting programming in the process? Um, so the Murph burner track, just to talk logistically, it's $7. You buy it, you get a program in team builder. You can use the app. Uh, you don't have to be one of, the, one of our current athletes. So if anyone's listening to this, you can be one of our athletes or not, but it's a 30 day program. Uh, to get you get you better at Murph at Murph at seven dollars, and then that money is then donated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. Um, and I'll be very transparent about those numbers on the podcast. Whether we have three athletes who sign up for it or three thousand, I will I'll be very transparent on the podcast about how much money we were able to donate and how many people signed up. Um, like I said, good good bad or ugly. Uh, now individually, what would you gain from doing the programming for thirty days? Really, it's just going to teach you to be more efficient. Uh, primarily in muscular endurance. So the goal of the 30 day program is to turn muscle contractions into an aerobic function. That is the technical goal of the program. And so the, and that's the reason why by the end of doing Murph for a year, I can do Murph and not be sore and I can do Murph and not have any problems with it. It's really becomes a, let's crack my, crack my knuckles and just execute it. And anyone doing the Murph project or Murph, uh, an excessive amount will tell you the same thing. It's not really something you get sore sore on. And that's because your body becomes so accustomed to this high volume muscle contractions that it is able to turn that energy into just an aerobic function and not this, not a purely muscular endurance to where you're getting super fatigued. And, uh, the programming is designed to, to make that happen. Will I be able to do Murph and not get nauseous? You're the only person I'm aware of <laughs> who, for some reason, no other workout you get nauseous on, but when you, when you go hard on Murph, you get sick. Um, no, other than you adjusting your, I, I don't know, it could make you more ready for it from an intensity standpoint, but I, I think it's a nutrition thing with you. Isn't that what we kind of landed on? Yeah. A couple weeks ago when I did Murph once I did a carb rinse halfway through and, uh, that really, really helped. And then I actually like took an actual shot of like OJ and it was just, it, it helped me a lot. Yeah. And yeah, uh, just to, so. just to plug a company real quick that has no affiliation, no, not a sponsor, whatever I've been using is um, liquid IV. Have you guys seen that stuff? Um, mm. It's a, it's an electrolyte drink like a noon or something, but there's 11 grams of sugar in it. Um, and so it's not something I would normally just be drinking, you know, throughout the day but I found it to be great if I am going to be doing a more intense workout, either immediately post or during, um, it seems to be a great one because it has enough sugar to actually be beneficial. Like noon has no sugar or like one gram of sugar, which is, is not going to help you during exercise. Um, but it's good to have for the electrolytes. Um, but the 11 grams of sugar seems to be the right amount to like get a little kick, uh, of energy in the workout. Yeah, I definitely think I'll need that. 
Yeah, try it out. Okay. I would ask why we chose that specific charity, because that's also the charity that we support with our merch as well, right? All yeah, the proceeds of our merch goes to that same one. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever fully explained that. So um, the last, let's see, 18 months of my active duty military career, I worked with Special Tactics, which is the special operations side of the Air Force. Um, and I got to work very closely with this organization, specifically the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. And um, there were unfortunately some men who were killed in action during my time there. And I got to see the Special Operations Warrior Foundation in action. Um, and it was the, some of the guys that I worked with were retired people, retired active duty special operators who worked for the government now in a civilian capacity. And then they also had more of like a volunteer role with the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. And so just working with them directly and seeing families of men I knew directly benefit is the reason they're really the only organization I'm interested in sourcing um, into three fitness uh, revenue towards or personal donations, because I, I don't know, I feel like donating money these days is a little bit hard, you know, like so many sketchy ones out there. Yeah. Like you don't really know, okay, what are you doing? Like we even, they found that out with the wounded warrior project, right. That seemed like a great thing to do. And then they found out like the, uh, people, what is the, the board of directors or whoever, they all had like these ridiculous salaries. They're all making like millions of dollars per year. Um, with this nonprofit and it's like how much I, you know, I don't know how much you should be paid. I'm not going to say you should or shouldn't be paid a certain amount, but they had what seemed to be excessive salaries for what they were doing compared to the market average for similar jobs. Um, and they kind of got a slap on the hand for that, you know, and you don't find these things out till years later. And I'm not saying that that's mm -hmm. not happening in the special operations where foundation, um, but they do seem to leave a little bit smaller. They have a very direct purpose, um, and like I said, I've seen them in action, so I'm a little bit more comfortable donating to them. Cool. I think I'm out. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was so When bad. does it start? Yeah. So when, we, when does the Murph burner track start? It starts May 1st will be the first workout and it goes through the entire month of May. So you'll be doing, if you, uh, sign up for the Murph burner track, either current athlete or other and, you know, if someone new, you will sign up, um, the workouts don't start to May 1st and you'll go through them with obviously concluding May 31st Memorial day, um, and hitting the Memorial, hit the Memorial day Murph. So finishing out by actually doing the workout. We'll follow the similar structure to the rest of our track. So, uh, four days a week, five blocks. It will be five days a week. Um, and five blocks. So we will not have, there will not be a meet yourself Saturday. Like it won't just be the same meet yourself Saturday that all the other tracks are seeing. Um, but there will be a harder workout on Saturday. It's more geared towards getting you prepared for Murph. And this is the, uh, partitioned Murph that Murph himself did not the CrossFit games unpartitioned one that people think is official. The only version you should do it and across the games even partitioned they just partitioned it bigger right they did five sets i know they've done it more than one time so i'm not familiar oh yeah because they've done it in absolutely no partition before as well and yeah i don't know yeah I, I you know i hate that debate on like how you should uh do the workout and this is why guinness won't allow that to be as as uh, i last heard um not allowed to like record it as a world record because there are too many variations like you can do yeah. Five sets of, or five sets of the, the 20 reps, 20, 40, 60 or whatever. And then you could do, uh, the 20 sets of five, 10, 15, or you could just do it all the way through. But the only people that really piss me off are the ones who pretend like doing a partitioned is like, or unpartitioned is the way it's like, yeah, you're shit. If you don't do it 100, 200, 300. And when you've done it every way to include backwards and three times in a row, you're just like, I don't know if you know what you're talking about. Like, I think you just are saying stuff because you think you're hardcore. So that's the, uh, rock and the shoot people. Yeah. The rock and the shoot people hundred <laughs> percent. And it's just slower. Just, I know I say this every time that's the slowest way to do Murph. So if part of what makes Murph hard is the speed. So that's the also, like, I know I'm not a huge fan of kipping pull-ups. I'm not, a, I really don't like them that much. 
And uh, that's a time where I think kipping pull-ups is a great way to test your mental fortitude because you'll be able to do the workout so much faster. If you kip the pull-ups, the heart rate's going to be elevated. Um, I've literally shared screenshots of Murph spending, you know, finishing uh, Murph in the 20 minute range with spending 99% of it in zone five. Like that's how much Murph can suck if you want it to. Uh, mm -hmm. But you have to kip to do that. I can do that if I was doing strict pull-ups. Yep. Any other questions? That's all I, I got so. for now. Yep. All right. I think that about does it. Uh, the only other thing I did want to hit on, uh, you guys did not ask was about our current athletes. You know, will this be a huge problem if you are coming off of, you're basically taking a break for an entire wave, right? So you, if you're on the strength track or you're on hard to kill track, you're going to be switching gears to the Murph track, um, the Murph burner track. Again, it's called the Murph burner track because it's getting burned after Memorial day. Like there will not be continued programming for Murph in perpetuity, unless we have a demand from greater than 200 athletes who say there must be a Murph track. That would be, that's the number of athletes that would need to tell us that there needs to be a permanent Murph track 200. Just so anyone is, is wondering, like if four of you are like, Hey, it needs to be a thing, not gonna be a thing. 200 of you say it is, we will, it'll be a permanent track, but I, I don't, we think, have no gear. Right. So I, I cause we, we yep. I set a really thri a high threshold cause I don't want to do it just to do it. Um, so anyway, how's this going to affect your normal training? And to be honest, it will, I am not trying to balance other things like BCT, like Kyle knows this and everyone else on BCT. I'm very not concerned with, uh, how many pushups you can do or dips or pull-ups. I'm not like we do a little bit of upper body stuff, but the goal of boring concurrent training is to get people better at running a fast mile and squatting heavy weight. And so that's what we're after. And so you kind of go into that track knowing, yeah, this is not as well-rounded. And while I think Murph, the workout is incredibly well-rounded by itself. It's like, it's got pull-ups, squats, push-ups with a vest. It's got running. Like, I just think, so to program for it is going to make you pretty well-rounded, but you might lose some barbell strength right? Like I'm not trying to balance that in my programming. I'm not like if you're coming on, if you're looking for some sort of barbell squat PR in the next, whatever amount of time, probably not the best spot for you. Okay. So that's the only thing I'll be very honest about is there won't be a huge strength emphasis because there's not a huge strength emphasis in Murph, but there will be an aerobic, um, and muscular endurance emphasis. So those things, uh, will make you better. Uh, but what I did find in doing Murph a lot, um, you, you tend to maintain your strength pretty well. Um, even if you do take a break. So and it's just four weeks. So yeah, it's only four weeks, but I don't want to discourage you from donating. Okay. So if you're like, Hey, I don't want to do the programming, but you know, throw my hat in the ring. We will have two options once the page goes live. So you can go to garage and check this out. We'll have a banner at the top, uh, talking about the Murph burner track. You just click on it and go there to see more details. There'll be one button that's like donate only and one button that is Murph burner track, purchase it. Either way, you'll be able to donate some money to the cause. Um, and then if you want to um, sign up for the Murph burner track and not do it, you can still download the PDF to have, which we will give you access to. So you'll have a full uh, PDF of the workout. So it is something you can keep and it only costs you $7 and we're not keeping any of that money. The money's going to the special operations warrior foundation. So I do highly encourage you to donate, even if the programming doesn't align with your goals. So you would be able to do the program, pay your seven bucks to do the program and also go and just hit the donate button and donate more if you wanted to. Correct. So you can do both. Yep. And that's, that was because we specifically had a question from some athletes of like, dude, you're only charging seven bucks. Like I want to donate way more than that. And, um, that's awesome. If you're in that camp and you have the, the funds for it, greatly appreciate it. So you do have a way to get the Murph burner track and then go back and, and donate more if you want. Awesome. All right. Let's talk, uh, harder to kill five miler. Yes, let's do it. Uh, this is a very so challenging workout to do and brief. Uh, so it's five, it will be a total of five miles, but while doing 
them in quarter mile or 400 meter intervals. And this was originally designed to be rowing, <clears throat> but you can do that uh, running as well. And there is a pacing chart, uh, which I'm not going to go over every single one, but uh, so the, so each mile is done at different intensities. So the f first third and fifth mile are done at the um, uh, faster intensities. And then mile three or mile two and four are the rest interval intensities. And I am air quoting rest because it is a five second pace difference. Uh, <laughs> enjoy your rest. So uh, you're going to do, it'll be the 400 meters. Each of those um, intervals are whatever the pace you set for yourself. So on the, I'll well, just do the competitors on the rowing, it's 124 per quarter mile. And on the compet on the running, it is 118 per quarter mile. But if you reach a quarter mile, that is whatever the pace you set for yourself. Uh, if you fail to meet that, then you are what's considered killed. And then you have to start over if it's, you do it within the first one and there's a two minute rest between intervals. Did I miss anything? Now it's, it's a hard one to brief, but it's fairly simple. So you really just, it's five miles worth of intervals. You go fast one, a little bit slower the next one, fast one, a little bit slower the next one, and then you get two rest or two minute rest in between. Is it each interval? Yeah, each quarter mile. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the 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 gist of it. There are just a lot of parameters to try and not get killed to make to gamify the workout a little bit more. Um, we've talked about this before. Those run times should be adjusted. All right, I'm not gonna lie. The <laughs> I know the, the rowing is fine. Lots of people have completed it, shared it. I've done it. Like a lot of people have shared the rowing version being completed. And what is going to confuse the pants off of everybody, because it always does on the rower, this is not a 500 meter pace. It is a 400 meter pace. If you need to figure out your own calculation for that, that's fine. But you could just pre-program this entire workout if you have a concept to rower and make it really easy on yourself. But if you think that I'm saying hold a 124 500 meter pace for five miles. Yeah. yeah you would, uh, you'd be in the Olympics, I think. So mm. not what we're, we're wanting to do. I think it comes out to being around a 145, 500 meter pace to finish a 400 meter in 124, or maybe it's a 140. It's somewhere in that range. Just so you know, I don't know the exact, but that's, that's close to what it is. And then the running should be adjusted. Uh, but yeah, don't forget about that getting killed portion you it's like stairway to heaven. If you pick the wrong, um, is it pacing or weight? You start over. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the same way with this. Like if you want to go out as a competitor, which I think there are like five in the garage gym athlete community, uh, true competitors. I don't know why you'd select competitor pace when you're not a competitor. Uh, so immediately start with established or recruit wherever you should actually start. And then, you know, add those five seconds if you die in that first, first mile. And if, this is the only time I'll tell you to like, quote unquote, cheat the workout. If you feel like if you ran three and you're established, if you're doing the running, because a lot of people don't have a rower and you were able to hold 133 pace, because that's the established for three of the intervals and your fourth one, you're like, I might be able to do it, but it's going to be really freaking hard. Just run a 140, get killed, and then <laughs> add, add the five seconds and, and start over. Because what's going to happen is you're going to roll in. You're going to, hmm. you're going to roll into the second mile and you're going to die on the first interval. And that's hardly a workout. Right. Um, so I'm trying to get you a good workout in. Uh, yeah. That's all my tips uh, and everything. Pretty sure. So I did, I, the first time I did this workout was circa pre team builder, pre garage gym athlete. And I went for the competitor. It didn't last long. Uh, so you were, I was able to do this. No, I, I ran, I've never actually okay. rode this one. I've only, I've only ran this one. And yeah, I won't say I it's easier, I, but it's more doable rowing. Yeah. I'm, I might've even gotten it mixed up. Cause I feel like I was, I aimed to do the competitor rowing times, but as a run and at 124 running is still pretty hard. And yeah, it, didn't, it still didn't go well. I remember my hamstrings were lit after this one. So warm up. <laughs> I mean, that's like the cop out, you know, tip for this one, but yeah do that i felt like i had something else but i already lost it yeah I'd, 
just just be mindful like what Jared said about your pace. Um, the rest pace is not very much slower at all. Honestly, somebody who can actually manage that the proper like distinction, you know, across the miles can actually manage that that pace. Uh, props to you because to me, like a I'm not advanced enough of a runner to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna back five seconds off and I'm gonna do that for each. 400 meter and oh then you're for saying the, like then for mile three i'm like oh i gotta i gotta i gotta add those you're five saying you don't you don't know how to throttle your intensity five yeah, I can't. plus or minus five seconds got yeah, it. yeah five five <laughs> seconds is not uh, yeah i can't throttle it like that no so people who can do that props to you you guys are awesome um but just be mindful of, of that that the rest pace is not much of a rest pace at all and most of us <laughs> yeah, probably can't thinking, tell like, the difference oh i'm just gonna yeah. i get to chill on this one you'll die your first yeah, four yeah especially after you know, you do your four, your first four four hundreds, and it's like, all right, yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty warm now, you know, and it's like, oh, but I get an extra five seconds. No, I can't, I can't tell the difference in that. So, those of you that can, props to you. The rest of us, just you're, you're just gonna have to go fast the whole time and see how many you can do. Um, I would say music. I don't really know what music to tell you. Something fast, something, something that's intense. got a solid, solid beat, something that's intense. Um, you know. Cause you can, if, if you use music in that way, um, so maybe something that you can base your running off of, like if you can base the, the way your feet hit the, hit the, the track, um, Basically, time it with the beat of the song. If you can do that, Spotify have something like that. Like if you have your phone on you, like it knows what tempo you're running and it tries to switch the song to a song that matches your tempo. There's a way to mm. do it. I just don't know how, and I know like the shoes have the sensor amazed. on it as well, but yeah, I don't. I, I think it would annoy uh, me. That I've never tried it. That's, but yeah. I've heard of it. If I was, if I was running, and then Spotify decided, hey, I need to change the song for you, you know, and that would get in my head a little too much. I think. I think. So. I think me too. Like I'll control my own music. It's fine. Yeah. I, I, I have, I have a next button on my earbuds. I also I don't, don't know what kind of like if you're sprinting 400, you might be at like 160, 170, uh, whatever steps per minute your stride. Um, mm. That's a fast song. Like that's I don't, really I'm not fast. saying I, I wish Ashley was here, um, or um, uh, even her her husband. Like they're both into music and would probably know the answers to those questions. Uh, but I don't know what that actually is. But it's uh, probably an annoying song, if I had to guess. Try with some banjo music. Get some banjo music. On. <laughs> you can run fast. Your official recommendation. They do play that really suck. Yep. You know? There you they go. I will say at the height of uh, BCT, I was banjoing. I was running fast. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Like, I don't know if you recall, Kyle, like how many 400 meter intervals we did, but I think I took one to failure. And I don't know if I ended up at like 12 or so intervals that I was able to hate, hold the hard to kill five miler pace. But I was also doing one to one work to rest ratio, which is about mm -hmm. 40 seconds less rest. Yep. So, I should have done that. It's not like, you know, yes, I've been running less and whatever, but I think my goal might be able to complete the hard to kill five miler running at the competitor pace just to prove it can be done. Um, well, I know it can be done, be done by me. Like if you get a track athlete who runs 400s, this is like a joke workout. They're like, mm, I could hold sixties for, for 20. Like, what do you want me to do? Uh, <laughs> but for, for the, uh, less advanced human, I would like to see if I can complete it at the competitor pace. I uh, would not. I'm not. <laughs> if I can hold established, I'd that's be not a that's happy. not a goal of mine. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that's it. You guys have anything else? I don't think so. No, unless you want to take your shots at my workouts from the past week. I don't. No, nope. letting <laughs> you letting you slide, man. It's good. Letting you slide. You climbed a mountain, so I'm not going to throw any shade there. Uh, you don't get to use that excuse next week, though. Oh, nope. I, I you're for a while. <laughs> it will be known to the world. Yep. If uh, anyway, that's the end. Thanks for sticking around, guys. You know, whoever's still listening, we really appreciate it. I always joke like nobody's listening towards the end. But there's probably plenty who are still listening to the end. Uh, we do appreciate all of our athletes. Um, you know, getting involved in the Murph Project. Oh, I totally forgot to talk about Garage Gym Tours. I knew I should have written that down. If you are one of our athletes and you want some free stuff, like if you're watching on YouTube, Kyle has an awesome garage gym athlete banner. He's got an EO three mug. Like he's really repping it. Joe's got a cool athlete shirt on. Like you guys want any of this stuff? 
for free, go to garagegymathlete.com slash tour. You have all the instructions there to sign up. I need to make sure I remember to say at the beginning of the podcast next time. If you want some free stuff, submit a garage gym tour to us. We'll publish it on our YouTube channel and you get some free stuff in the process. It's that easy. Um, but other than that, for everyone who is listening, we do appreciate you. We appreciate the community. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what we can do with this Murph burner track as a collective community and donating our dollars to uh, a good cause. I think it'll be really cool. Like I said, I'll be super transparent with the results and, and where we get on that. We have a lot of support from a bunch of different areas. So we'll dive more into that in an upcoming podcast because we'll be talking about this all May. Uh, if you're not one of our athletes, you're not involved in all the cool stuff we're doing. Huge mistake, big problem that you can fix by going to garagegymathlete.com, signing up for a 14-day free trial, join in on all the awesome stuff that we're doing, and also get amazing programming in the process. That's it for this week. Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.